So I do have one disclosure. Uh, we did a clinical trial that was uh, uh, successful. It documented the effects of a remotely delivered intervention, and a company, Healthways, is actually marketing it with Johns Hopkins, and so there's an institutional conflict of interest. Okay, so um, I decided to approach this uh, as uh, sort of a top 10. Um, I guess that's David Letterman if I, but I don't watch late night television, so I'm not even sure that's correct. But um, so I've uh, done research on behavioral strategies to, um, to improve uh, cardiovascular health, and often it really has focused on um, excess weight, or either as the focus or as part of intervention. So I thought I'd share with you uh, uh, 10 uh, sort of findings that I, um, and most of them have come from, from our shop um, at Hopkins, but others have uh, been uh, done elsewhere. So um, the first thing I wanted to mention uh, or, or, or was that, uh, Age is uh, probably a bit paradoxical in that many people think that uh, older age people cannot, you know, make uh, lifestyle changes, and quite frankly, it's just the opposite, that, uh, that older age individuals in our behavioral intervention studies actually do much better than uh, middle-aged individuals. This, this was a results of a clinical trial called TONE, and we randomized um, uh, close to, I think it was close to 800 people, half to weight loss and half to no weight loss. And what you see is a difference of about four kilograms in, um, in weight loss between active and controls. And, and they kept it off for, for, for two and a half years without any evidence of recidivism. Now, this was a study just in um, overweight individual, oh, elderly individuals. Individuals, um, but the same. But we've actually done studies with middle-aged and older-aged, and, and um, middle-aged individuals like myself do do don't do as well as older-age individuals. And um, there are many possible reasons. There could be physiologic reasons, but the other thing is that they could be. Um, uh, that, that individuals can focus more on their behaviors uh, uh, that are needed for uh, sustaining weight loss, like exercise, uh, uh, physical activity, and reduced calorie intake. A second uh, point I wanted to make is that, unfortunately, there are major differences um, in the ability of people to lose weight and actually uh, sustain weight loss. And uh, in a group of individuals that unfortunately doesn't do as well are African-American women. And um, uh, this is, uh, we found this in, in, in actually most of our studies, and the group that does well tend to be um, non-African-American men. Um, uh, it might be that they are less, ha have less experiences with weight loss, and so they're more successful in the first round. Um, but uh, this was a clinical trial that enrolled about 1,600 individuals, and, uh, in the, and uh, the group that did the best were, uh, were men who were non-African-American. Uh, <clears throat> I now want to talk about weight regain, which uh, uh, popular now this past week, uh, if you read the New York Times, including yesterday. I'm not sure there have been any questions about it, but uh, I'll, ta I'll cover that issue about uh, uh, regain among um, the, the, uh, the biggest losers. Um, we have done a, a weight loss uh, maintenance trial where, we, uh, where everybody got a weight loss intervention, and then we randomized people to different strategies to keep weight off. And so phase one on this, and that's the, I guess I'll use the pointer here, uh, everybody uh, got a weight loss intervention. On average, people lost eight kilograms, and then they uh, then we, people were randomized. This was the experience in the group that didn't get an active intervention. You can see uh, regain over two and a half years. But what is interesting is that um, it's partial regain, regain. It's not complete regain, and uh, that's actually a message that didn't come across in that article, uh, the, the stream of articles this past week. Uh, now. So this was the, uh, uh, the headline from yesterday in the New York Times, uh, Why You Can't uh, Lose uh, Weight on a Diet. It was actually a misleading title um, because um, <clears throat> it actually is, they actually experienced partial regain. And so I just put on um, the right side here uh, the average weight loss at the end of the competition, which was quite substantial, 58 kilograms. The weight regained over six years was 41. And so the average net weight loss that was sustained was actually 17 kilograms. So they kept off about a third. Um, so I think that a, there, there's actually been more hype uh, to this than, uh, than uh, the study warranted. And actually it was a pretty small sample size, 16 individuals. 
Um, we tested in that study the weight loss, getting back to our own trial, um, two different interventions, one uh, that involved per, uh, frequent personal contact. And in that intervention, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, there was modest effect of monthly uh, contact with a trained interventionist, uh, but still there was a, a net reduction of about one and a half kilograms beyond what the uh, uh, control group uh, experienced. Uh, we then actually uh, published, uh, our actually continued intervention. So this is a trial with about five years of intervention. We actually re-randomized the people in the, uh, who got the monthly personal contact and it turns out that continued intervention actually had no significant impact. So our, our sense is that if you've learned, you've typically learned after about uh, two and a half years all the tools you need, and continued intervention at that point is not likely to help, even with monthly contact with, a, um, with an interventionist, which is a fairly intensive interventionist for, intervention for a, over a, a, a long, or long haul. Um, now, a lot of people are interested in technology. Uh, we tested a web-based intervention, um, and uh, the intervention, uh, despite being, having a lot of bells and whistles, actually had no significant impact in terms of preventing weight regain. And this actually, by the way, is, has, it's, it's, there, there are a lot of people that are interested in apps and you know, combinations, apps and websites, but there's actually very, very little evidence that those are A, effective in, in achieving weight loss, and B, effective in sustaining weight loss. Um, uh, unfortunately, because I think there are a lot of people that are very tech savvy, can write apps, and, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have great evidence. Uh, uh, sixth point, diets that emphasize different macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, fat, <coughs> do not lead to different weight loss. Now there have been, you know, this, uh, this is probably the most, uh, one of the most popular topics um, uh, that is covered uh, in, um, in, you know, by individuals who uh, uh, report on weight loss. But the best study uh, that I know of was done by a colleague of mine, uh, Frank Sachs from Boston, and he randomized people to four different diets. Um, and each diet, um, one diet actually, oh, I'm sorry, let me, sorry about that. Um, the first diet was very high in carbohydrate, that's the diet with the triangles, and then the fourth diet was at the least amount of carbohydrate, that's this diet here. The, and what you see is that basically all four diets led to about five kilograms of weight loss on average, and then over time there was weight regain, but again, there was absolutely no difference in terms of the extent of weight loss on high carb versus low carb diets. And, and the importance of this study is that it was within the study that people were randomized to these uh, different uh, diets. Um, <clears throat> seventh, um, and uh, th this hurts me quite a bit as a primary care doctor, but there's actually little evidence that doctors are effective at delivering behavioral weight loss interventions. Um, and I, I wish that weren't the case, but uh, a colleague of our, mine, uh, Tom Wadden, did this systematic review, um, and he reached the conclusion there's little research on, uh, on primary care practitioners providing intensive counseling, a range of trained uh, interventionists who, are, who provide such care by phone or in person could be considered. And the reason why this is important is that um, actually about five years ago, CMS, um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, actually had this grand pronouncement that there's grade A evidence. And when, I, when, when Tom Wad and I heard about this, we go, wait a second, what evidence are they reviewing? Because it's actually very weak evidence. Um, but uh, they came up with uh, that pronouncement and decided that they would cover um, uh, weight loss interventions in the primary care setting. Uh, for better or for worse, CMS did not provide sufficient funding, and so, and so almost no primary care office actually offers those interventions. Um, so, um, so they basically didn't review the evidence correctly, and they didn't provide enough funding to do it. So I guess maybe that's the, uh, uh, they maybe made the right decision with underfunding it. Um, the one study that actually compared multiple strategies uh, to accomplish weight loss in patients of primary care providers was done in England, and uh, this is a, a randomized trial with about seven uh, different groups. The 
uh, exercise group uh, is the reference. And if you look at these, um, uh, this is the extent of weight loss within uh, each of the groups. Weight Watchers was the best. They had these other uh, 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 programs that I'm not as familiar with, Slimming Down, Rosemary, um, uh, Conley, Size Down. Note that physicians assisted by a nurse and physicians assisted by a pharmacist had, were worse than control, okay? So uh, again, more bad news for primary care providers. All right, um, <clears throat> eighth point. Remote delivery of weight loss interventions can be as effective as in-person interventions. This was a clinical trial that we published about five years ago, um, and uh, it was uh, it really just tested mode of delivery and uh, was, I think, quite important because most people had thought that the way to deliver interventions is actually have people, you know, get around a table, schedule a meeting, and, um, and you have, you know, weekly sessions. Well, there are huge logistic barriers to that. I don't know about you, but if somebody told me, you know, I need, you need to uh, uh, to participate in this program, you have to show up every Monday and you have to show up for 10, 10 weeks in a row. Uh, huge barriers. So we tested remote delivery vis-a-vis -vis, uh, telephone. And uh, what was important was that the telephone-based intervention, which is in the red line here, was as effective as the in-person delivered intervention. And so now a lot of people, when they think about uh, you know, either studies or even uh, programs such as the program I have the conflict on uh, are, are really trying to implement um, remotely delivered interventions using a multi-channel approach, telephone plus computer and, and uh, app. Not app by itself, but app in combination with, uh, with a um, provider. Um, Ninth point, this is actually important, um, uh, and uh, I, what I was showing you in all of the previous studies is actually average weight loss. Um, what people don't realize is that the weight loss experience by in, in, w even within a group is actually substantial. And so this is actually a, a frequency histogram. Um, so this shows the, a the, the average might have been five kilograms, but you have somebody who lost 40, and another person who lost 16. And so those, those graphs that show very clean you know, means or averages really hide a lot of variability that occurs within the active treatment group as well as the control group. Um, I was actually embarrassed when somebody um, said, we'd like to interview one of your participants for a, a, a story that, the telev that a television um, station was airing. And the best person we could find you know, uh, on short notice was somebody in the control group who actually lost weight. Um, and that happens actually quite a bit. You know? And you also have people in the active intervention group who, uh, who uh, gain weight. So it's, uh, it, it, there's a lot of variability that is sort of hidden in, um, in, in the way we present our data. And uh, I, I, th my tenth point sort of amplifies what, what Kim, Kim was discussing, which is uh, prevention. And I, quite frankly, um, am sort of like Kim dealing, dealing with people who are overweight or obese. Uh, and what I think is we need to really deal with the, the, the big culprit, which is the, the toxic environment. And so Kim pointed out, you know, uh, portion uh, size is a major uh, uh, reason, but there are, there are many reasons. And, and quite frankly, we witnessed one today. Uh, I didn't know about you, but I do not eat brownies and cookies in the middle of the afternoon, okay? And so we provided those, uh, and, you know, you, we're tempted, you know, we walk past them and we want to eat them, but the reality is, Nobody needed any extra calories today. Most of you, including myself, have been sitting. You know, I didn't get any physical activity today. You know, I probably need less than 2,000 calories to keep my weight. And if I eat one of those cookies or, or brownies, I probably got 10% of my, my calories just by sort of casually, you know, consuming something. So anyways, um, these are some of the... Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, I have about three of these slides. I gave a, I gave a talk in Iowa, and so I, I went online, and they have these, these wonderful uh, pictures uh, from the Iowa State Fair, and this was deep uh, fried butter, um, amazing. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I had those as lead up to, uh, to an unfortunate uh, uh, sort of state of the evidence, and that is that 
it's really difficult um, to prove that the environment is causally related to obesity. We can't do randomized trials where we assign people to, to one community versus another and follow them for five years. Um, a, a, a PhD student working with me did a, um, a systematic review of the literature on this topic, and the, and the evidence is actually very weak, even though most of us um, in, you know, who work in the obesity field believe that the environment uh, and changes in the environment over the past few years really is uh, the causal uh, problem. So uh, this was her conclusion. Limited evidence for the association between local food environment and obesity. Uh, still, this needs to be interpreted ca cautiously because of the low quality of available studies. So I guess um, we'll take questions afterwards um, um, and look forward to um, your thoughts.